In this video, we will first talk about how multiple antenna communications are improving our wireless systems in terms of enhanced data rates, but also higher reliability and better coverage. Then we will talk about some of the terminologies that are utilized in practice, but haven't been used in the course so far. Things like analog, digital and hybrid beamforming. We will talk about polarization, subarrays, 3D beamforming. And finally, we will have a look at some of the things that were not covered in the course. What are the important things that we left out? And what are the future research directions that are related to multiple antenna communications? The data traffic in our wireless networks is increasing rapidly. So here is some data from Ericsson Mobility Report. And it's from 2021, so the data from the previous years here is the real one. And you can see how the number of exabytes per month that is transferred in cellular networks all around the world is increasing by around 45% per year. And the yellow bars is representing previous technologies, 2G, 3G, 4G. And from 2020, 5G is contributing as well. And 5G will enable the traffic to continue growing like this. And after a while, 5G will contribute to maybe half of the data traffic in the world. One reason for this exponential growth in data traffic is that we use more devices. But the number of devices is growing much more slowly. So the main contributing factor is that the traffic per device is increasing. And to some extent, it is that our use applications are requiring higher data rates, such that we would like to stream video with higher and higher resolution. But more importantly, it is that the users are active more often in our systems. The 50 to 100 megabits per second that 4G can deliver is enough for many of our everyday use cases. So it's really about that we are using the services more and more, and that when we're using them, we are needing a higher fraction of that maximum data rate. That is what is leading to this exponential growth in data traffic. So how can multiple antenna communications impact that? And really, how is 5G utilizing multiple antenna communication to enable it to deliver a big fraction of the data traffic in the future? The first topic in this course was point-to-point -point MIMO, where we have one transmitter and one receiver. It might be one base station and one user device. And the goal of point-to-point -point MIMO is to provide a higher data rate for the user. And suppose that there are four different base stations, and depending on where you are in this area, which is 1,000 times 1,000 meters large, you will connect to different ones of them. And depending on where you are, you will have different distances to the different base stations. If you connect to the closest one, you get the best of the signal qualities. But there will still be large variations in data rate because you will have large signal to noise ratio variations. So if this is a conventional system, then with MIMA technology, what can we do? We can make use of the beamforming gain to increase the amount of energy that is transferred over the channel, which means that wherever you are, you will receive a stronger signal than you would get with just an antenna that didn't use beamforming. And that is lifting up the performance everywhere in your coverage area so that you get better performance wherever you are. Moreover, you have the multiplexing gain, which means that you can transmit multiple signals at the same time, at the same frequency between the transmitter and the receiver when you have multiple antennas at both of these devices. And that is then also changing the scaling here. So in this case, I have doubled the scalings to represent the fact that we are sending two data streams at the same time, or two layers. That is a term that is also often used in practice. So point-to-point -point MIMO is really about increasing the data rate. So that if you need a high data rate, well, then you can use the technology to achieve that. And even if you don't need that high data rate, you can be active only part of the time. And then momentarily, when you're active, you get the high data rate. But on the average, you only get what you need. Multi-user MIMO was the second topic that we talked about. And this is really about spatial multiplexing of users. So say that you have a cell area where you have two different sector antennas pointing in different parts of the cell. And if you have few antennas, you will send out broad beams and it doesn't make much sense to try to direct them towards where the user is because you're anyway covering the entire sector of the cell. But with multi-user MIMA, particularly massive multi-user MIMA, you have a large number of antennas, which enables you to direct 
narrow beams towards users and therefore you can serve multiple users at the same time even if you are dividing your cell here into three different sectors which is very common in practice within each sector you can send multiple beams towards users in different directions and thereby increase the total traffic capacity in your cell. So multi-user MIME is not so much about increasing the data rate per user but to enable many users to be active at the same time so that within your cell area you can deliver more and more data. And this is particularly important for the reason that it's not the highest data rate that is the limiting factor in many cellular systems, but it is the fact that you cannot deliver to all of a user at the same time, and that more and more users will be active at the same time in the future as the data traffic is growing. And the enabling factor of the spatial multiplexing of users is that we have many antennas, so we get narrow beams, and in that way we can limit our interference. And it's not only about trying to direct the beams towards users and making sure that the beams are narrow enough, but actually to tune the beams in such a way, using methods like zero forcing, in order to limit interference that is caused between the users. A lot of the focus in this course has been on the data rates, on the channel capacities or lower bounds on the channel capacity, but multiple antenna communications have big benefits also beyond the data rates. In 5G, there is the concept of ultra-reliable low latency communications or URLLC, where the idea is that instead of having as high data rates as possible, we can trade away efficiency in terms of data rate to get a more reliable system, which is achieved by not trying to operate at a capacity, but at the lower data rates where you have an even bigger chance that your signal can be correctly decoded. And to achieve a low latency, you shouldn't try to send very long block, which is what is needed to achieve capacity, but you should instead send short blocks, and then you also need to deal with the reliability issues that is appearing when you send short blocks. The benefit of multiple antenna communications is the channel hardening phenomena, namely that when you have multiple antennas that are observing different fading realizations, when you are combining the effect of all of your antennas, you will get a fading variation that is averaging out. So here I'm showing the channel gain for different random realizations of a channel. And if you just look at one of the antennas, you have large variations. But if you take 100 antennas, that all of them are seeing this type of random fading realizations, but they are different, and then you apply your beamforming, well then the variations will average out, so you will improve the channel gain over your effective channel after beamforming, and you will also see smaller variations in the end. So if we are using multiple antennas, we will need fewer retransmissions, and we will get more predictable performance thanks to the channel hardening phenomena. Another use case of 5G beyond the two that I've mentioned, high data rates and reliability and low latency, is something called massive machine type communications or MMTC. In this use case, we are not after having a very efficient transmission in terms of data rate, but to have a very energy efficient transmission. So we can put up many battery powered devices. It, it might be Internet of Thing devices or some other electronic devices that should transmit with low power and that should be able to be covered over large areas, so we will have a cost-efficient deployment. And if you have a conventional base station that is reaching a certain range here, well then, thanks to the beam forming that you have when you have multiple antennas, you can extend the range where you can deliver a certain type of performance, and you can also extend the range where you can listen to the different devices. We can use the beamform gain either to extend the range, or to let the devices that are close by reduce their power and we will still be able to receive the signal thanks to the stronger gain that we get from the beamforming. We will now switch focus and talk about some practical aspects with multiple antenna communications, introduce some of the concepts that are used in practice and that are related to the concept that we have covered in this course but which we have not mentioned yet. So traditionally, a base station have had this format. We have a passive antenna, an antenna that is radiating in the same way all the time. And then we have a radio unit that is generating an analog signal that the antenna should radiate. And it's put underneath the antenna, down at the base here, while the antenna is up in a tower or at a rooftop. And then the radio is connected with a baseband unit, a BBU. And the radio is also sometimes called a transceiver chain. And this is essentially how base stations were built in the 3G era and before. In 4G, 
The radius started to be small enough so they can be put up in the tower next to the passive antenna. And the benefit for that is that there is less power losses over the cables from the radio to the antenna because the distance is shorter. The baseband unit is still below here. You will have some kind of cabling here, but since it's a digital signal, the losses are not seen in the same way. And now starting with 5G, the radius have become so small that we can integrate them together with the antennas and create arrays of so-called active antennas, also known as antenna integrated radius. So the antenna that is radiating the signal and the radio that is generating it, or the transceiver chain if you like to call it that, they are all co-located and we can create an array of antenna integrated radius like this and that is what we call massive MIMO. Each antenna integrated radio can be called an active antenna. And whenever we have used the term antenna previously in this course, we have referred to active antennas, antennas with an integrated radio that they can control. However, in the past, passive antennas has been dominating. So it's important to know the difference between passive antennas and active antennas. Another recent development is that the baseband unit doesn't have to be underneath the base station anymore. It can be moved to some other location. We can use a fiber cable here of a certain length and we can place it in what we call an edge cloud. And multiple base stations can share the same processing hardware here so we don't need to buy different equipment for different base stations. In this way we can save on hardware cost because every base station doesn't need to have a dedicated computer that can deal with both low load and high load but since all of the base station won't have high load at the same time, the maximum number of users, well then they can share resources and we can cut down on the total amount of resources that are needed for processing. The concept of beam forming have been around for over a hundred years. And for that reason, the name beam forming have also meant different things at different times and also still means different things to different people. So I will try to explain you three different things here. Beam steering, beam forming or generalized beam forming. Beam steering means that we are from our base station, steering a beam, creating a beam in one angular direction, but it's not associated with a particular user, it's rather associated with a particular location. In rural areas where most of the users are located along some roads, for example, we can steer the beams towards those locations. We don't know where the users are, but we know statistically that the people will be there. And this will then enable us to, on the average, get stronger signals on the location where the users are likely to be. Beam forming, on the other hand, means that we are sending a beam in one angular direction, but we are designing it based on the user channel. So we are sending pilots so we can learn where the user is, and then we are forming a beam towards this location. And traditionally beam forming is referring to the fact that we are sending a beam, a physical beam like this in one angular direction because the user is located in that angular direction. So this is precisely how this transmission will look like in the free space line of sight scenarios that we have considered in the previous video. Generalized beam forming means that we are transmitting to one user, but the transmitted signal doesn't have an angular directivity that is apparent from looking like this, because we have a multipaths channel. So in order to reach the user, we will send beams in a number of different directions towards different scattering objects, and then the signal will reach towards the user and we will get a strong signal to user location, but it won't be like that we are sending a strong lead directive signal from the base station like this. And generalized beam forming is what we will do whenever we have a non line of sight channel. So we learn the multipath channel and then we are transmitting in a way that is adapted to that channel. Previously in this course we have used the term beam forming for both traditional beam forming and generalized beam forming. I think that is a fair thing to do, but it's important to be aware of that some people, particularly people in the hardware area, will view it as two different concepts. And traditionally, this was what people meant when they said beam forming, because that is the only case when we are seeing an angular beam in one particular direction. The type of beam forming that we have been talking about in this course is also known as digital beam forming. And it means that every antenna in our array have a different separate transceiver chain connected to the digital baseband, which means that we can control every antenna separately. 
which is giving us a full flexibility to create any superposition of beams towards different users. So if you have a user here, it's a non-line of sight because we have a blocking here object. Well, there are two different ways that the same can make it to the user. So we are sending two different beams in different angular directions. They are bouncing on these objects and then they are reaching the user in phase. If we are making sure that it transmit the signal through these two different beams are phase shifted in such a way that the signal are reaching the user in phase. And this is what is happening automatically when we are taking the multipath channel and we are using it as our beamforming vector. And we have another user here that is also getting superposition of multiple beams in order for the signal to reach the user. While there could be other users that have a line of sight channel and then we only need to transmit one focus beam towards this user. But the important thing with digital beamforming is that we have full flexibility to adapt our transmissions to our users based on the entire multipath channel. We can vary the power of the antennas Typically, different antennas will see different fading realizations and we should transmit more power on the antennas that has a strong channel for the moment. And also when it comes to the frequency domain, what we have been talking about previously in this course is that we are taking our time frequency grid and we divide into these coherence intervals where we have a fixed channel over time and we also have a fixed channel over the frequency domain, so it's just one value. It's important to notice that we are updating our beamforming every time a new coherence interval starts in the time domain. But over the frequency domain, we are also using different beams. So we have some kind of frequency selectivity in the beamforming. That is enabled by the digital beamforming because we are controlling the signal here. So we can have different signals at different frequencies and control it differently, assign different phase shift, different powers and so on over the frequency domain. When we are using beamforming to serve multiple users, it's also known as pre-coding or multi-user beamforming or multi-layer beamforming. In some cases, we might be transmitting multiple signals, multiple streams to the same user at the same time, and then we have multi-layer beamforming. So digital beamforming is providing us with this full flexibility, but there is something else. For example, there's something called analog beamforming, where from our digital baseband to the different antenna elements here, there's only one transceiver chain. So we can only create one signal, but then every antenna is connected to a phase shifter that is delaying the signal in different ways in order for us to form a beam in a particular direction to determine in which direction will the time delays be such that we are getting constructive interference in this particular direction. And this type of analog beamforming will perform similar to digital beamforming in some cases, namely when you have a line of sight channel so that you would like to direct the signal only in one angular direction because that is what analog beamforming is good at doing. But if you have a non-line of sight channel where there are multiple paths leading to the user, we can only beamform in one of those directions because the array can only create one beam at a time. And also when we have multiple paths, we have the issue that over the frequency domain, we will need to send beams in different directions because these paths are interacting in different ways, creating what is known as frequency selective fading over the frequency domain. And traditional analog beam forming can only transmit one beam and it needs to be the same over the entire frequency domain. But in line of sight scenarios where you only would like to serve one user at a time, analog beam forming can be competitive towards digital beam forming and it might be easier, cheaper to build. Something that is in between digital beam forming and analog beam forming is called hybrid beam forming. In this case, you have multiple antennas and you have multiple transceiver chains, but the number of transceiver chains is smaller than the number of antennas. And there is a connection between the transceiver chains to the different antennas using phase shifters. These phase shifters are creating a few different beams in different angular directions. They need to be the same over the entire frequency domain, but you can create multiple beams and then you can use the fact that you have multiple transceiver chains in order to transmit digital beam forming as a superposition of these two different beams, for example. And this can enable you to serve multiple uses at the same time. You can, to a limited extent, take care of multipath propagation as well, but you don't have the full flexibility as with digital beam forming. And this can be a competitive technology compared to digital beam formings in some scenarios where you have few users and you have rather 
line of sight dominated channels. When it comes to beamforming gains and multiplexing gains, there is a trade off between these two different concepts. Say that we have two different antennas and we are transmitting the same signal from both of the antennas but with a certain phase shift so that we are creating a beam in a particular direction. Then by having two antennas you get twice as strong signal in the desired direction as compared to having just one antenna. And that is the beam forming gain. If we go up and have four antennas we get four times the signal gain in the dominant direction and that also means that there is less energy in other directions we have a more focused transmission. And when you have a very focused transmission, we can transmit multiple beams in different directions. And each of these two beams will share the same kind of directivity as this single beam here. But since we have a constraint on how much power we are transmit, we need to share the power between the two different beams. So in this case, we have scaled down. We have four times the beam forming gain, but we only have half of the power. So we effectively only have twice the signal power in the direction as compared to having just one antenna. And if you have two antennas that are transmitting two different signals, you can still create beam forming in different directions. For each beam, you get the beam forming gain that is delivering twice the signal energy in a dominant direction, but you also need to divide the power between them. So for each user, you're not receiving more signal power than you would get with only one antenna, but you're still able to deal with the interference to some extent. The array geometry is determining what kind of beams that we can transmit. And there is a concept called three-dimensional beamforming that is important to know about. If you put all of your antennas in a uniform linear array in horizontal dimension, well, then that means that you can transmit beams in different directions in the horizontal plane, also known as azimuth beamforming. So this is illustrated here with beams in different azimuth angles. If you are instead taking a linear array and put it vertically like this, well then you can steer beams up and down and we call this elevation beam forming. So both of these two options are steering beams in different directions in a two-dimensional plane, either horizontally or vertically. But if you are combining these ideas and create a planar array that is spanning both the horizontal domain and the vertical domain, then you can create what we call 3D beam forming beams that are in different angular directions in the azimuth plane and in the elevation plane. So up and down and in different directions, this is what we can do with an array like this. And this is how 5G arrays are typically built. So practical base stations are capable of this kind of 3D beamforming. Another aspect of wireless signals that we haven't covered in previous videos is polarization. So suppose a radio wave is propagating along the x-axis here. Then there are two other dimensions, the Y and Z dimensions, where the signal also exists. And in particular, the electrical field could oscillate in different directions. In this case, we have a horizontally polarized wave, which means that the electric field is oscillating along the Y axis here. And in this case, we have a vertically polarized wave. It is still propagating along the x-axis, but now the electric field is oscillating along the z-axis. The transmitted signal in a wireless communication system might have any of these two polarizations or something in between. Some other direction between y and the z-axis could be the one where it's oscillating. But even if the transmitted signal have a particular polarization, the propagation channel will typically change it, particularly when we have scattering in the propagation environment. But anyway, since we have two dimensions that the transmitted signal can exist in, in terms of its electrical field, there is an additional dimension, the polarization dimension, that we can utilize in communication. And this can be utilized particularly in point-to-point -point systems in order to transmit two signals in the same direction but with different orthogonal polarizations like this. And to utilize this extra dimension, we need to utilize polarized antennas. So they could be horizontally and vertically polarized antennas. So a vertically polarized antenna is only reacting to radio waves that has oscillations along the vertical axis. And we have the opposite for a horizontally polarized antenna that is only reacting to radio waves that have oscillations along the horizontal dimension. And since these antennas are typically also physically 
distribute them horizontally and vertically, we can actually put them at the same location and create what is known as a dual polarized antenna. Two antennas with different polarization at the same location. Since our world is not symmetric in the horizontal and vertical dimensions, uh, it could be that one of the dimensions is better than the other one. And therefore, conventional base stations are typically using polarized antennas that are not horizontal and vertically polarized, but has a minus 45 degree slanted polarization and plus 45 degree slanted polarization. So they are reacting to signals that have these two different axes, something in between the Y and the Z axis. And we will see in a moment how we can create arrays for massive MIMO with this type of dual polarized antennas. But before we do that, I will just say something more about our physical world. Because the users are typically living on the ground. And the buildings that we have in our propagation environment typically have a limited height. And this is determining something about what kind of propagation channel we should expect to exist in reality. So if you put up a base station at the top of a building, it's typically meant for providing coverage to users on the horizontal plane, on the ground, in a sector of 120 degrees. And usage can be distributed over this angular interval in any way. Usage will be down on the ground somewhere over there. Then if we are considering the fact that the base station is elevated above the ground, uses can also be at different elevations, meaning that we would like the signal to go in different elevation angles from the base station towards the user. But the angular variations are typically much smaller. In the largest case it might be 90 degrees, from something that is at the same height at the base station all the way down to the ground underneath the base station. But typically the angular interval that is of interest is much smaller than this, because if someone is very close here, well we don't really need to beam form down to it because we will anyway have a strong signal down there. And this is important when we are building practical base stations. The fact that horizontal beamforming is of most importance, while the elevation beamforming, which is also part of the three-dimensional beamforming that I was mentioning, is less important, but also something that can be used in particular in cities with high-rise building, where we can beamform to users at different floors of the building. Here's an example of a typical array that you can find in a real system, containing 128 and 10 elements. So we can see that there is eight elements horizontally, eight vertically, and each of them is drawn as a cross like this because it's a dual polarized antenna. So it's eight by eight times two polarization, that is 128 and 10 elements. But even if you have 128 elements, it doesn't mean that we have the same number of radius or transceiver chains. To save cost, hardware components and energy, we might use fewer radius. So here's an example of how to do that. A Massive MIMO base station in 5G might contain 64 radius, also known as 64T, 64R, meaning that there are 64 transceiver chains both for transmission and reception. And the way of mapping this 128 and 10 elements to 64 radius, how should we do it? Well, we should remember that it's more important to be able to have a good resolution for horizontal beam forming than vertically in the elevation domain. So the way to deal with that is that we can take two adjacent antenna elements having the same polarization located vertically and map them together to the same radio. So they are transmitting exactly the same signal. We call this a subarray. And here, every subarray contains two elements of each polarization. There are two inputs, one for each of the polarizations. So each subarray really contains two antenna elements with the matching polarization. If we are now counting active antennas as we've been doing in this course already from the beginning, namely antennas with radius, then we have eight of them horizontally, four of them vertically, and then we should double that because we have the two other polarizations as well here. Another way of building a array with the same number of antenna elements is to only have 32 radius. In this case, we could create subarrays containing four different elements that are next to each other vertically. So now we have doubled the size of our subarrays and effectively cut the number of radius in two. And in terms of the ability to steer beams in different horizontal directions, it's essentially the same here. But vertically, we have less resolution, so we can only steer the beams very little up and down. 
if we count the number of active antennas vertically here, there is only two of them. So the important thing here to remember is that when we are casually saying antenna in the massive MIMO or MIMO literature, in academia at least, we are not referring to antenna elements, we are referring to groups of antenna elements that are sharing one radio or the same transceiver chains and in that way are forming one active antenna. So we count the number of active antennas, not the number of antenna elements. So let's now have a look at what had been happening with the evolution of active antenna technology over the last decade. So a conventional antenna is not active, it's passive. It could be one of these type of sector antennas. And if you look inside of the box, it actually is containing eight antenna elements here. Each of them might have a certain antenna gain, seven dBi. They're only connected to one transceiver chain. And since we are now feeding all of the elements with the same signal, what we will effectively do is to create a fixed beam forward and this beam will see a beam forming gain of 9 dB from our 8 elements. We add it to 7 and we get 16 dBi. So this is a typical type of sector antenna. Then over the last decade we first have seen in 4G arrays with 8 antennas. And what an array with 8 antennas is containing might be 64 elements with 32 for each polarization. But there is only 8 uh, transceivers or 8 radios and the two of them connected to each of the columns, one per polarization. And in this way, there is no possibility to steer beams in the 3D manner in the elevation domain, only horizontally, because we can only control each of the columns, but not the individual rows. And then the 64 antenna panels that I was mentioning, they might contain 128 elements, 64 per polarization, there might be 64 transceiver chains here or radius and we are creating this type of subarrays where we have two adjacent elements vertically that has the same polarization, they are mapped to the same transceiver. And with this type of array we can create 3D beamforming. We can transmit beams in different azimuth directions, in different elevation angles and we are then able to serve uses in all different parts of our cell. And it's particularly useful when you have many users and you have them also distributed both in azimuth and elevation. Here's a picture of one of the first massive MIMO deployments. So it's the first one in New York City by Nokia, an array like this. And here you can see if you take off the front of it, you can see that there is these eight by eight elements and each of them have a cross shape here because these are dual polarized antennas and they are slanted polarizations. These photos were taken by my colleague Eric Larson in 2018 and today in 2021 massive MIMO and multiple antenna technology in general have evolved already within the 5D standard. So this is one of the latest base stations from the vendor Ericsson. It is meant for the 3.5 GHz band and within this box here that I'm carrying that only weighs 12 kilos, you can find 32 antennas, meaning 32 transceiver chains. So you can transmit in the uplink and the downlink with 32 antennas of the kinds that we are analyzing in this course. And within the box there is actually 128 radiating elements. This box can be used by an operator to communicate over up to 200 megahertz of spectrum in this 3.5 gigahertz band and transmit with up to 200 watt into there. And there is integrated circuitry inside here that is computing the main things that we have been talking about in this course, such as the beam forming and channel estimation. MIMO technology is also making it into the new bands that are used in 5G, such as the millimeter wave bands. And here is just one of the first examples of such a equipment that contains antennas and processing everything and the size is much smaller than these arrays here. And you can put on a lamppost, for example, and operate it to serve uses at the street level. I don't know precisely how many antennas are inside of this one, but it can definitely be used to beamform to uses at different locations of the street. So these were examples of how multiple antenna technology is being used today. And the same theory that you have learned in this course can also be applied in future wireless communication systems. And I believe that multiple antenna technology will be used even more in the future. And in particular, in terms of new deployments concepts. So one way would be to, instead of having this kind of arrays with 
128 element 64 antennas, we might distribute the antennas over a larger area. So they are not located at discrete locations at rooftops or in masts, but they are scattered around the users. So instead of having big antennas at certain locations surrounded by users, you will have users that are surrounded by small antennas that are transmitting from all different angles towards you. This deployment concept is called distributed MIMO because you have an array of antennas but they are distributed geographically. And sometimes it's also called cell-free massive MIMO with the idea that we will not divide the world into cell areas but there will be antennas everywhere and wherever you are you will be served by a subset of them, those that are reaching you as a user. Another variation of the concept is something where you are decoupling the antennas from the radius you put it at a very different location. This has been known as reconfigurable intelligent surfaces. You might have a transmitter that is sending a signal towards a surface that is reconfiguring its properties in order to be informed towards the receiver. And partially the same kind of multiple antenna theory can be utilized to analyze this type of scenario. And finally, if a 64 antenna massive MIMO array is something that was supposed to be massive, well, it's actually not very large if you put them at a rooftop. It's not much larger than conventional base stations because it's massive in the number of radius, not in the number of antenna elements. And it's not physically large. But we could in the future create truly physically large arrays that might be covering the entire facade of a building. In this case, new electromagnetic phenomena will show up. We will be able to focus the signal end in a different way. This type of beams that we like to draw is something that can only be observed when the receiver is sufficiently far away. It's in the far field of the transmitter. And if we would build truly physically large arrays that are covering a large part of the user's field of view, then the receiver will be in the near field of this entire array, which enables us to not form beams, but to focus the energy more like a lens towards the location of the receiver. That would require us to model the channels in very different manners, but we can still apply similar multiple antenna communication theory as we have been describing in previous videos. We have now reached the end of this course, and let me just briefly mention some of the important things that we didn't cover. So when it comes to point-to-point -point MIMO systems, we didn't talk about having imperfect channel knowledge, which is something that is always important in real systems. You can never get perfect channel knowledge. So how can we deal with that? That is something that one could look deeper into. When it comes to massive MIMO, we did cover the cases with imperfect channel knowledge where we were estimating the channels, but we didn't talk about other types of processing methods than maximum ratio processing or zero forcing. There are other methods, particularly in multi-cell scenarios, we can take interference from other cells into account as well in order to better deal with interference. And we can also go beyond the IID Rayleigh fading models that we considered and consider correlated Rayleigh fading, where there is a directivity in the channel, but still some randomness. Finally, we could also, when it comes to fading channels, deal with the fact that the channels are not changing abruptly between different coherence intervals, but both over the frequency domain and over the time domain, there are gradual changes, which we can utilize to estimate our channels better, for example, to predict things over time or to do some interpolation over the frequency domain. So there is a wealth of further topics in this area of multiple antenna communication that you can learn.